and good morning to you. It's good to be in God's house on this last Sunday of August. Seems hard to believe that summer, I don't want to say summer's almost over because please God, no, but right after Labor Day, I know that we're seeing yellowing leaves and some of the trees are turning red. So uh, we are soon winding up summer, but it's a glorious day today and we're glad to be gathered in God's house for worship. And now I'll ask you to stand as Matthew leads us in the call to worship. Who may abide in the presence of God? Who may live on God's holy mountain? All those who walk blamelessly and do what is right. All those who speak truth from their heart. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you have shown us the truth of your commandments. Give us sincere hearts that we may serve you with joy, obey you with love, and manifest your wisdom to the world through Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now please join together in our first hymn for the beauty of the earth, hymn number 14, verses 1, 3, and 5, and also displayed on the board here. the call to confession. With sincere hearts and minds, let us confess our sins before God and the world, trusting in God's mercy to forgive. Let us pray together. You tell us, O Lord, who may abide in your presence, who may dwell on your holy hill, those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and who speak the truth from their heart. And yet, O Lord, we do not walk blamelessly so often we stumble on the path of faith. The truth makes us nervous, and we pretend not to know what is right. Have mercy, O God. Convict us by your wisdom. Cleanse us by your grace. Challenge us by your presence. And by your forgiveness, free us to try again. Continue confessing your sins in the silence of your heart. Friends, do not despair. God renews us by the word of truth that we might become the first fruits of God's creation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we, we are, are forgiven. forgiven. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. 
I don't want to talk to the kids now. There's three of them here, and there's lots of grown-up kids, and I think hope there's some listening from watching from behind the cameras. So we've been talking all month about food, right? God provides food for us, heavenly food, eternal food. So today we're talking about perfect food. So if you had to name a perfect food, what would it be? A perfect food. What do you guys think? I know I always look at you and call on you because lots of times you're the only kids here. So if you had to think of a perfect food, what would it be? It's a hard one, huh? What do you think mine is? Chocolate, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Right? I don't know. I don't know that it would. I don't know that. Could you think I would live? Do you think if I only ever ate chocolate? Do you think that's enough to like sustain me and stuff? No. What else is a perfect food? Anybody else? We're all kids. Lloyd. Mother's milk. Mother's milk. There you go. Okay. That's a perfect food, right? What else is a perfect food? Pizza. Pizza. Okay. Bill Music says pizza. Now we know what to have delivered to his house, right? <laughs> okay. Pizza is, and really pizza, if you think about, okay. Um, pizza is a perfect food. What else is a perfect food? Anybody else got an idea? No? Chocolate. I'm still sort of saying chocolate. Um, bread and water, are they perfect foods? They're sort of like carbs and liquids, right? I mean, that's what we need. So, you know, um, beans and rice, perfect protein. Our son-in-law is from Louisiana, and he made red beans and rice on Friday night, and that was really awesome. So we're still eating red beans and rice. That's pretty close to a perfect food. I think part of it is that if you're, what your perfect food is depends on where you live, right? So I've been on the North Slope in some of the North Slope villages, and do you know what muktuk is? Do you guys know what muktuk is? It's, it's whale blubber, because on the North Slope, they go hunting for whales and seals, and they take the whale blubber, and they preserve it, and then they eat it. And it's, if you grow up in the North Slope, and you're an Eskimo, and you pick, or an an Inupiat Eskimo, it's really good. I've seen babies eating muktuk. And it's, you know, like an inch, like an inch by inch squares of whale blubber, right? And I tried it once to be polite, and it wasn't my perfect food. So, (laughs) um, but I've seen babies just chowing down on muktuk. They just love it, right? And I think babies in France, I've seen babies in Paris. You know, in Paris, if you go to Paris, you can have a long baguette, like a really long piece of bread. I've seen babies in the subway in the metro in Paris just gnawing on a big baguette because for them, that's their perfect food. But for all of us, God gives us the perfect food. So what do you think the perfect food is that God gives us? Not chocolate or muktuk or a baguette. What do you think that perfect food is? There you go. See, George preaches my sermon for me every week. <laughs> so, right? It's the food that God gives. It's the food in the sacrament. Next week, we'll celebrate communion. But it's also the food that God gives us when we study his word and learn from him. So you guys got the lesson all right. Let's pray together. Holy God, we thank you for the perfect food that only you and your son provide for us. Help us to be open to your spirit that we would seek your perfect food and feed on it always. We pray in Jesus' mighty name, amen. The psalm of the day is Psalm 15. It's found in your pew Bible on page 420. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest 
who does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Amen. And let's pray together. Holy and almighty God, we thank you that when we rely on you and depend on you, we can stand strong in the face of sorrow and fear and sadness. We thank you that you make us strong through your word. So this day, as we hear your word, we pray that we would feed on it in our hearts by faith, and that as we hear your word, it would take root in our hearts and grow and bear fruit for your gospel and your kingdom as together we learn to tell the good news. We pray in the name of him who is our rock and our redeemer, Jesus Christ, amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes to us today from the book of Deuteronomy. It's chapter four, verses one through 14. And now let us hear the word of the Lord. So Moses is on the plains of Moab with the children of Israel. They've completed their journey through the promised land and they are waiting on the plains of Moab for, whoops, <laughs> for God to give them permission to cross the Jordan and enter into the land that he's been preparing them to occupy. And so God says through Moses, Moses says to the people, now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of your ancestors is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. But all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, Horeb is Mount Sinai, when he said to me, assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land, may teach them to the, your children. You came near and you stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and then wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. And here ends the lesson from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy. The, new, the gospel lesson today, we've switched back to Mark. For five weeks now, we've been in John 6 studying uh, Jesus' words about the bread of life. Now today we're back in Mark's gospel and we'll stay there, I think, except for a couple Sundays until the end of this uh, church year, when the beginning of Advent. So today it's Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 15, and then 21 through 23. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat until, unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So scholars think that Mark's gospel was written to people who didn't grow up in the faith, right? Who were not necessarily Jewish believers. Mark's gospel was written to many people 
throughout the ancient world who had grown up Gentile. And so when you see a parenthesis like that, it's because Mark's explaining, right? A Jew would have understood the nature for ritual hand cleansing, right? But Mark wants to, his, his Gentile readers to know, and so it's a great explanation for us too. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. That's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Whoops. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. And here it's the lesson from the gospel. Finally, our third lesson today comes from the book of James. We finished our long study of the book of Ephesians, and now we're spending five weeks in James. One of the, it's the letter written by Jesus, by the brother of Jesus, James, to the ancient church. So today we're in the first chapter, verses 17 through 27. And James wrote to the ancient believers, Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting that what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And here ends the lesson from James. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is the last Sunday of summer. Next week's Labor Day and then fall. And even though we're still in COVID time and trying to figure out what does this, our ministry and our worship look like compared to last fall looks really different, but even compared to the fall before that, it looks different. We'll still have some form of Sunday school, child Sunday school. We're going to start it on the 12th um, by harvesting vegetables. We've done that every year for a couple years. We will have some form of adult Bible study. It'll be a, a adult Sunday school. It'll be a Bible study, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be on Zoom. That just seems to accommodate more and more people, and we'll start that in October, so that'll be our fall adult Sunday school. We do have some fellowship events outside planned and you'll hear more about those as the fall commences. Elizabeth put a September calendar out on the table out there so you can pick up a calendar. We have kind of more on the calendar right now than we've had for a long time. Um, I'm noticing in my house I have to turn the lights on sometimes, right? That's crazy. Like when Paul and I, you know, leave the living room and go to bed at 10 o'clock, it's pretty dark in our bedroom. I'm like, oh man, we have to turn lights on. I think the lights come on in my car sometimes now, right? Right? 
So the world is turning, at least here in this hemisphere, right, to fall. All month we've been talking about how God provides for us through Jesus as our bread of life, and it's a great time to talk about that in Alaska. There's harvests of blueberries. People are going hunting. Penelope went hunting, right? Harvested a caribou. Um, fish, there's, can we use still fish? Can you still catch things? Yeah, okay, so we can still fish. The gardens are, are bearing fruit. We have raspberries we haven't picked yet, right? So it's a really been a really good month to talk about how God provides for us through Jesus as our bread of life. We spent five weeks in one chapter of John. That's a pretty significant to- amount of time. If you think there's 12 months of the year, we spent a twelfth, more than a twelfth of that of our sermon time, studying one chapter of the book of John. Today we look back, we go back to Mark, and we'll stay there until Advent. But we still have one more Sunday of talking about God's provision. We've had all kinds of ways of talking about and defining food and nourishment. We've talked about comfort food and soul food, heavenly food. We've talked about strength and life. And so today I want to talk about perfect food, and you all did a really good job of defining that publicly for me in the kids' message, right? We know what perfect food is. It's the, per- it's the only food we need to sustain us. Today's the culmination of these five, now six weeks of discussion. So as we look together at Deuteronomy, Moses' sermon, last words to the people, and then Jesus' words in Mark's gospel, and then James, we're about to spend five weeks in James, we get to hear how God provides for us through the perfect food, the only food we need. We're going to begin with Moses and the children of Israel on the plains of Moab before they crossed over into the promised land. Moses was not going to get to enter the promised land with the people of Israel, even though he had led them from slavery in Egypt out of darkness through the fire and the Red Sea and through all those years of wandering in the wilderness. Moses had displeased God. You can read about that story in Genesis and Exodus. And Moses was told by God, Joshua, Moses' successor, would lead the people. And so the people are gathered on the plains of Moab. I think that from where they were on the plains of Moab, east of the land of Canaan, they could see on a clear day the land of Canaan down the the cliffs, across the Jordan River, and into the promised land. And Moses gave them, the book of Deuteronomy is essentially Moses' last sermon, right? Scholars think it was several sermons, put together, but it's Moses' last words for the people. Moses needs the Israelites to understand all that they need to know to live into this new life towards which God's been calling them for so many decades. And so he reminds the people of God's law given to them on Sinai. Horeb, the text said, but Horeb and Sinai are the same mountain. Moses talked about God's voice thundering from smoke and fire. Moses reminded the people that the giving of God's law for them was God's demonstration of love. It was the covenant that God made with the people and the people responded and said yes. It was God's demonstration of love. This is how you are to live together. All those rules, all of those ways of behaving that we know. Honor your father and mother. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember that God is one. Don't steal, right? All of those more than rules, but ways of behaving and thinking and believing. God says, this is how much I love you. I'm helping you to be a covenant people to live together. It was the law given at Sinai that created and shaped and cemented them together as God's people. And I'm using that word cemented on purpose because cement, once something's in cement, it stays there, right? Has anybody ever poured cement and then had an animal or a kid walk across it or put a handprint in it, right? Okay, and so some of you are nodding, so we've had that experience. And so we know that when that happens, that handprint or that moose footprint or whatever it is, is in that cement. You have two choices. You can break up the cement and start over, or you can pour new cement over top of the mark, but it's still going to be there underneath right? So God's law 
was what cemented and held the people together in a way that was unbreakable unless God did it, right? So that's God's demonstration of love for the people. The people's demonstration of love for God then is keeping the commandments and following the law. Moses says, observe carefully what the Lord your God has called you to do. In Hebrew, the observe carefully, what's translated in our English version as observe carefully. In Hebrew, that's really two words, keep and do, right? Keep in my mind when I think about that. Keep is remember, right? Keep the covenant, remember the covenant. And do is our actions, our walking the talk, our carrying it out. If you observe carefully, or if you keep and do, Moses says, this will result in wisdom and understanding. Because we need both, right? Wisdom is knowing the commandments. But understanding them is what do I need to do in my life to keep those commandments? Because it doesn't look the same for every people. I know somebody who does not like chocolate. Okay, so he could have baskets of chocolate in his house and he wouldn't be tempted. That's not the case for me, right? So if my personal commandment is, I don't wanna eat chocolate today, for me, that means not leaving it on the counter, right? That's what I need to do because I understand. I mean, that's just a really dumb example and not life changing. However, I know what I need to do to not eat chocolate, I can't see it. Paul and I could have six freezers full of ice cream and would not call my name, I wouldn't care. If I didn't open the, fr I don't care if there's ice cream. But my mother-in-law, on the other hand, when she's visited us, she's like, how can you guys have all that ice cream in there, right? Because her, that calls to her name, her, that calls her. So, so it's not just the wisdom in knowing what to do, it's the understanding in how to keep it. And then Moses says to the people, so observe carefully these commandments, keep and do them. And then remember your history. So a couple weeks ago, we said goodbye to Abby Spencer. Her mom just, and Connor didn't get to go, but Evan and, right? And they left Abby in Texas, at Texas A&M, right? And how's she doing? She's good. Homesick, right? She's good, okay. And they took her and left her, right? Because that's what parents do, is they take their kids to college and then they leave them and, and hopefully they stay there right? You know, it doesn't always happen, right? Melody is leaving. Melody and, and Joey are leaving when? On the 10th. So Bill and Becky's uh, oldest son and daughter, Melody just graduated from high school the way Abby did, and they're going to go to Western Washington University in Bellingham. And so they're leaving on the 10th to drive down, the two of them together, right? And we know, because we know these parents, that they've grown up and that their parents are trusting that they will send them off and that the kids, the young people, the young adults, will do well in their new environment because they remember who they are. We sent our 19-year-old, how old was Cameron when we just left him in Boston? 19 or 18, uh, anyway. We sent our son to Berkeley School of Music in Boston when he was my baby, right? <laughs> really young and just left him in an apartment so he could go to Berkeley School of Music and Paul took him and rented a car and found an apartment and bought a futon and all that stuff. And I remember having a conversation with Cam. Remember whose you are. Remember who your parents are. Remember our history together. That's what Moses says to the people. Remember the things God did, how he spoke to you from smoke and fire. Remember and teach your children. So remember refers to the past, right? Remember what you did, how we raised you. And then teach your children in the future who God is and his covenant with you. I think one of the hard things those of the kids and those of the grown-ups that have had to do virtual school is not all the senses are engaged, right? The kids are sitting there, they get to see their teacher, they get to see some of the other students. Penelope, could you see the other students when you're doing virtual school? Maybe. On Sometimes, right? But it's not the same as being present in the same classroom, 
right? That's why the school district is working so hard this year to keep classrooms open. It's not the same as being in the same room with people physically. Teach your children, Moses says, to remember your history and tell them about how God loves you and then help them to follow too. Listening, the word listen is used over and over in this chapter and over and over in scripture. In um, Latin, the word listen is audire, which uh, we get our word audio, right? It's oral, O-R-A-L and A-U-R-A-L, right? Oral history. But in Latin, if you take those two words apart, audire, it means to hear toward, right? So telling and obedience and following has to do with listening and speaking. Moses says, observe carefully, keep and do the commandments. Remember your history and tell your children. Moses is saying, eat the perfect food of God's law. The food that sustained you and supported you in the wilderness and will support you in your new life in the promised land. So Jesus and the Pharisees talked about food too. We switched back to Mark's gospel today. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Most of Mark's gospel is talking about the passion of Jesus, right? This crucifixion and resurrection, but a lot of the beginning chapters of Mark's gospel are the prelude to Jesus' crucifixion. And so Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And so many times in Mark, there's conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees or Jesus and the crowds. We have learned to think of Pharisees as hypocrites. Jesus calls them hypocrites in this text. And we have a negative Um, understanding, I think, of Pharisees, which is unfortunate because the Pharisees by Jesus' day were the keepers of the religious tradition. They were the ones who wanted the commandments to be kept, those commandments we just talked about that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. And the Pharisees through the centuries since Moses had developed an oral tradition, a spoken tradition based on the law. So they took the commandments that were given at Mount Sinai and they took the fleshing out of the commandments that we can read about in Leviticus, right? And they developed an oral tradition and they taught it to their children. And so the Pharisees were concerned with exactly what Moses was saying. Keep the commands and laws God has given you today. Honor our tradition, honor our laws and tell your children But by Jesus' day, the Pharisees had minutiae of rules and laws. And in this text, we read it and we think, oh, wash your hands before you eat. Of course you would do that, right? Since COVID, we're super concerned about that. My watch will tell me that I have to wash my hands, is it 16 seconds or 13 seconds or 20 seconds or something? And if my watch doesn't think I've washed my hands long enough, it starts beeping at me. Wait, you're only at 10 seconds, right? Okay, because good hand hygiene is important for good health, right? That's not a secret to anyone. The Pharisees, though, were not concerned with cleanliness and hygiene. They weren't concerned with clean hands, but were concerned with following the Mosaic law. There were so many rules. If you were in the market, you had to wash your hands. If you touched something unclean, the wrong kind of food, or a woman after she'd given birth for a, for, to a baby, You had to wash your hands, and there were specifically described ways you had to wash your hands. You had to rinse your hands and then hold them up so the water didn't land back in the basin but landed on the ground, right? There were so many ritual ways. Now, it's clear from Jesus' discussion and Jesus' actions in all the Gospels that he respected the law and he respected tradition, Because it's the law and the tradition that kept them connected to their history. It's our traditions that tell us, that teach us who and where we are and where we come from. Every family, I think, has their own just kind of special, not secret, but special unique traditions. And our kids, when they grow up and become adults, sometimes they carry on those traditions and then they invent new ones and that becomes part of their tradition, right? You know, I know exactly how to cook a turkey because my father taught me, 
right? And if anybody else cooks the turkey, it's good turkey, but it's not the right turkey, okay? Because my dad taught me. And my brothers do it the same way that I do. Now, it's been a long time since I've eaten a Thanksgiving dinner in one of my children's houses, but I hope they're cooking that turkey the right way, right? Okay, that's just a tradition in our house. Our traditions keep us connected to who we are. And Jesus respected the law and the tradition. But he also understood that sometimes tradition and the law was given more importance than love and God's people. Jesus said what comes from the inside matters way more than what you do on the outside. Eugene Peterson wrote the message, right, Paraph- uh, paraphrase of the, new, of the Bible, says, it's not what you swallow that pollutes your life, right? It's not what you swallow that pro- pro- pollutes your life. Jesus accused the Pharisees of misusing the law to hurt the people in order to demonstrate their own holiness. So, um, that text, that phrase that talks about korban. Okay, basically, what the Pharisees encouraged people to do sometimes, it's kind of like a first century tax shelter. Okay, someone could set aside. So honor your father and mother was taken very seriously. If if a if a family, if a man and a husband and wife didn't have children, they were dependent on the community to support them. So. Honor your father and mother was a moral obligation. But in Jesus' time, there were people who said, I'm going to give my estate to the temple, to the synagogue. And so this is God's assets. And then because they did that, they would neglect their parents and wouldn't take care of their parents. Okay? So Jesus accuses the religious leaders of permitting that and fostering that, right, in order to demonstrate holiness. And Jesus says it's not what happens on the outside, but what happens on the inside. So I read this week a man who grew up in a church, and he said that in his childhood church, I'm not going to tell you the denomination, they had a six-point record system, okay? There were offering envelopes in the pews, and there was a line for your name and the amount of your contribution. But there were also six little boxes where you could put a check mark every week. And next to those boxes were six actions. Worship attended, Bible brought, Bible read daily, Sunday school lesson studied, prayer daily, and gave an offering. So somebody at the denom- denominational headquarters said, these are the six actions that define faith. Not following the Ten Commandments, not demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit, not whatever. These were the six actions. And so he says this, this man who I think is a Presbyterian now but wasn't as a child, he says, to show up at church without a Bible in hand was unthinkable. Some visitors once came to the service and they sat down in front of us. I whispered to my father, did you see that? They don't have Bibles. My father smirked, he said, and said, they must be Presbyterians. Okay, so, so I just thought that was funny, all right? <laughs> because, I mean, and so he said, even the size of the Bible seemed to indicate the sincerity. Women toted around in giant embroidered cases with lace trim. Do you remember that? I used to have a big lace case for my Bible. Men would put their leather-bound Bibles on the top of the pew in front of them so that everyone could see how they had underlined and studied and how the Bible fell open to the right place. And he says, as a kid, he took it really seriously. He brought his Bible every Sunday, and he did all the other things that he had to check mark on that envelope. And he knew that as long as he was doing those things, he would stay on good terms with God. Okay? What truly matters, Jesus says, is where your heart is. It doesn't matter if you've done those six things or a long list of 15 other ones, right? Heidi Houston is a Presbyterian pastor um, in the Seattle area. And she says this about the heart. Jean Peterson says, it's not what you swallow that pollutes your life. But she says, in the Bible, the heart isn't the organ that pumps 
blood through the body. It's a metaphor for a person's innermost core or spiritual center. I say that all the time. It, for us, we think of heart and it's the part that gets, you know, oh, over a sweet fluffy puppy or a little kitten, right? In the Bible, that's not how heart is translated. Heart is shorthand, Heidi Houston says, for the total person, for one's whole being your or self. So if you have a pure heart, as Jesus calls us to, it's a life directed to and devoted totally and unreservedly, unreservedly to God, because God sees and tests and searches the hidden depths of the heart. It says in, when it's talking about David, right? God looks on the heart. Human beings look on the outer things. God looks on the heart. The phrase hardness of heart is used not only for God's enemies, like Pharaoh in the Old Testament, but also for God's people. In the New Testament, that phrase hardness of heart describes not only the scribes and the Pharisees, but also the disciples sometimes. A hard-hearted person is self-centered, impervious to spiritual things, resistant or closed off to God and what God wants to do in that person's life. So it's deep below the surface of things that God does God's work in us. What truly matters, Jesus says, is where your heart is. Because evil comes from our actions and attitudes. That list of actions and attitudes at the end of the gospel text is really, some of it is actions we take, some of it's attitudes of our hearts. And so Jesus says to us that it's the perfect food that's seen in how we live that matters. And only Jesus himself can produce that kind of inner transformation necessary. So I don't always, um, we hear a psalm every week, and sometimes it seems that the psalm goes along with what we're studying, and sometimes it doesn't, and I don't always refer to it. But this week I studied this psalm a little bit. And, and the um, scholar that I was studying said that 100 years ago and through the history of the church, our ancestors would read a psalm, and you heard Matthew read the psalm, and it says, who can stand on your holy hill, right? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord, okay? Our ancestors, this person said, wondered, how can I, a sinner as I am, approach a righteous and holy God, right? How can I approach that mountain where God speaks with thunder and fire? That's what, through most of the centuries of both Old Testament and New Testament, God's people have wondered. We wonder, this author said, how can an all-loving, accepting, and gracious God get along without me until next Sunday? Right? Is that what we wonder? But in Jesus' teaching, we have to understand that sometimes our actions keep us away from God. We understand that God gives us unconditional love, but we have to understand that we have responsibilities too. And so then, here's this really awesome phrase. We're told to come as we are to Jesus, right? Some churches have that on the top of their, you know, on the doorpost or on their bulletin. But it's the nature of Jesus' love that he never leaves us as we are. We're told to come as we are with all of our faults and sinfulness and struggles. But the nature of Jesus' active love for us that we see so clearly in this text from Mark's Gospel says that Jesus never leaves us as we are because it's the inner transformation necessary to be disciples of Jesus. That means that what's inside us is important. It's the kind of actions that James talks about. We're going to unpack James's letter much more in the weeks to come. But, Jesus, but James says that following Jesus is listening and doing because our hearts aren't right because of a law or words on a list, because, but because of the perfect food that only Jesus gives. Come as you are to Jesus, please, exactly as you are. But understand that part of discipleship is that you won't leave, Jesus won't leave you alone, to stay as you are. Because of the perfect food, the bread of life, for us, through us, God provides for the world, always. Alleluia. Amen.
Let's pray together. Holy and almighty God, we thank you for the perfect food that you provide through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray for open hearts and lives and minds and spirits that as we seek to follow you, you wouldn't leave us as we are, but you would work your transforming love in us and through us that we might reach out to the world and tell the good news that there is perfect food available and ready and waiting for all of God's children. We pray in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. And now how can we pray for each other this day and this week to have joys and concerns to share? Uh, Scott Swanberg had open heart surgery uh, uh, this week. He's home from the hospital. He had a heart valve replaced. He's doing well. He's um, having to be very careful and hold on to a pillow whenever he stands up or gets in or out of the car, but he's doing well. So we can pray for Scott. Uh, Sandy Charlton is still recovering from surgery, as is Karen. Egg How else can we pray? Anybody? Yes, Bill. Uh huh. Okay. 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 All right. And we'll pray for. Melody and Joey, off to college soon. Anybody else? Yes, Sue Ellen. Prayers of peace and comfort for the Keller family and the loss of Art Keller on Friday. Okay, for the Keller family. Anybody else? Yes, Jean. Oh, wow. For a visit? Okay. 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 All right. Anybody else? Yes, Laura. I also have to. My husband's baby is like a month old or so now, and he was born with a problem with his intestines. Okay. Oh. Okay. In the hospital. Okay. 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 Coworker's dad. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Kim. I need you to talk really loud, okay? I'm sorry. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So Kim's asking, there have been several COVID exposures that we know of in our congregation, not here in the building, but we know of in people's lives outside the building. And so we can remember them and also uh, for the servicemen and women in Afghanistan. I know that all of you like me have seen the pictures of, the last I saw it was 13 Marines, a Navy corpsman and an army sergeant, I think, who died uh, in the explosion in Kabul, maybe Wednesday or Thursday, as well as uh, 160, I think, Afghan citizens. So um, I know you've seen those pictures. If you haven't, you can. Um, I know many churches are reading their names today. I chose not to do that, but we can remember those families. Uh, the other thing is that um, Paul and I were here yesterday morning uh, working on this broadcast, and I got a phone call from my mother's uh, retirement community in California. Um, you know that my dad died four years ago, and they were calling me to tell me that my mom had died in her sleep on Friday night. So um, they have to wait. By the time they found her, it was too late to do anything. So um, 
I feel like my brothers and I are all of a sudden grown-ups. Does that make any sense? Both of our parents are gone now, and so um, I'm not sure. I don't think I have to go to California right now because all of the death certificate things can happen virtually, but there's just, as anybody who's been through a sudden death or even a planned one, uh, or a, a, uh, not a planned one, but a, a, a known one, an expected one, there's just a lot of details. So uh, we weren't expecting it, and it was very much a, a hard phone call to hear. So if you'll just keep me and my family in your prayers too this week as we kind of navigate this new world. So let's pray together. Holy and almighty God, we thank you for gathering us here this day. We thank you for forming and shaping us to feed on your word and to be strengthened and nourished by it. Lord God, there have been so many prayer requests lifted this morning and so many more that I know we've kept close in the silence of our hearts. We pray for people who are struggling, new babies, people struggling with COVID, neighbors and coworkers and friends. We pray for people facing difficult diagnoses, for people recovering from surgery, whether the surgery was just a few days ago or a few weeks ago, or they're still struggling after many months. We pray for people walking in the darkness of addiction and depression and ask that you would shine your light into their lives. We pray for people who are mourning for the families of those service members killed last week. They were doing what they were called to do, and they lost their lives doing it. We pray for them in a time of unimagined sorrow and struggle. We pray for the families of all of the Afghan citizens who lost their lives as well. We pray that the continued evacuation from Kabul would go smoothly with no more loss of life, and we pray for comfort and strength. We pray for school teachers in classrooms that are shut down, and for children and for parents who are worried. We pray for all of us as we learn to navigate this world we're living in that we didn't ask for, and we're still learning, Lord. And so we pray for your comfort and your strength and your peace, as every day it just seems that there's something else. But we know with you we can be strong and that when we're weak, you are still strong. So we thank you for the blessing of knowing that we belong to you and to each other. We thank you for this blessed community of faith, the ones present in this room and the ones present through technology who are watching from home. We thank you that you call us to support each other and love each other and care for each other. And you help us to do that, even in COVID time, especially in COVID time. We thank you and praise you that you've gathered us here to sing your songs and tell your story. And now to be drawn close to you in the Holy Spirit's power and presence, as together we pray the prayer that Christ our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a few announcements, as always. Um, there will be a memorial service for Cy Keel. He died earlier this year, and there's a service in here at 4 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. If you'd like to provide some homemade goodies, we're going to have fellowship out on the patio after. Rain or no rain, you can tell Stephanie. She's sitting in the back, and we would appreciate your donations of cookies and, and other things. Um, what's the next? Kim Arlington is hosting a coffee fellowship at her house on Tuesday at 1030. It's for any ladies and brave men who would like to join. So if you'd like to go, um, you can ask Kim or her uh, uh, address is in the directory. There's a calendar out on the table. You can pick it up and there's a lot more happening in September than there has been happening. And there's also the September, October uh, upper room devotionals. 
Uh, last Tuesday's meeting, the session approved an updated version of the COVID mitigation plan, and um, we sent the new language in an email, and the whole plan is now available on the website. Um, Paul, did you put the birthday list? No, okay, so we're not gonna sing, but there is a birthday list in your bulletin. This is the last Sunday of the month, which is the Sunday we celebrate birthdays. And so there are cupcakes after. I saw them in the fridge when I got the flowers out. Okay, so there are so many birthdays and anniversaries in um, August, and we just celebrate you. And finally, here's the ways you can keep up with your financial stewardship. If you're here and you'd like to leave a gift, you can put it in the offering plate in the back. Let's just take a moment to pray. Lord God, I thank you for your your faithfulness to us and our faithfulness in being good stewards of our time and money and our resources. So we thank you for the good gifts that you give to us that we now return to you in so many ways. Help us to use your gifts for your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is We Give Thee But Thine Own. It's number 708. Please stand and let's sing together. Amen. And now, good friends, hear this good news. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in God's grace and love and power. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ever ask or imagine, according to God's power that is at work within us, to God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and forever. In the name of the Father and the Son, Son and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Have a good week, everybody. Bye.